Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're getting started here in just a couple minutes. We have our two speakers, Melissa and McCoon. Vijay, who's our who's our um, treasurer, is actually going to be logging in here. He's uh, going to be moderating today's uh, today's talk on uh, intellectual property strategy. So he is almost here. Can you screen? Great. I hope everyone's having a good time. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for joining. Um, today, we're going to talk about intellectual property and how it relates, and it relates to software. Um, there you go. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so there's some technical glitches. Um, so, so some background around this topic. Um, this is kind of true to my heart. Um, when I came up with this topic around intellectual property strategy for software and Jamar and the rest of the UCI board was, you know, um, responsive and, and helped me out to create this. So I really appreciate the team's efforts. Um, this kind of started was actually just some, you know, background. McCoon and I actually used to work together in our first job out of college at a company called Unisys Corporation. And uh, when we first started, we were kind of thrown in the deep end and we were, we went within our, our first project right out of college. Um, the team that we're working on decided to give us the opportunity to start patenting our idea. Um, and so um, when, we, when, I, when I thought about that, I thought about how that has caused, um, you know, me to use that, those, you know, that knowledge throughout my career. And I wanted to kind of share this knowledge and some more professional ideas around how intellectual property impacts our design of software as software engineers. And that's kind of where this all stemmed from. Um, so today we're gonna, you know, we have Melissa Patterson and Makun Sharma. We're both graduates of UCI, and now they are both um, legal professionals, and they've been working in the patent law uh, industry for some time. And so we wanted to kind of understand their ideas. What does what what impacts do they have on software development and creating patents and vice versa, what do developers and software engineers need to understand about the discovery process of creating intellectual property within software. So um, Makund and Melissa, um, I, I see your, you know, your, your, your bios here and hopefully everyone had a chance to read them, but just due to the, you know, the conscious effort of time, I'm gonna kind of move forward with the agenda. Um, oops, there we go. Um, so, so I think the first step here is Mukund, um, I believe you were going to talk a little bit about the discussion and the importance of intellectual property in software development, um, you know, what, how it relates to uh, software developers and what to look for. So you want to kind of get started and maybe talk a little about yourself and, um, and, and give us some insight into what you've seen. Um, yeah, sure. So I am currently, my title is Senior Patent Counsel at Align Technologies. We make Invisalign. Um, just quick disclaimer, you know, all views are my own. They're not the company's or legal departments. And um, anything that we're saying is not legal advice, right? So just with that out of the way, um, the importance of intellectual property in software development, um, I think it's pretty critical. Uh, software is, you know, it's not a tangible asset. It's not like a it's not like a piece of real property. There's not land. It, it, there's not even a quite often, uh, you know, like a widget or like a physical thing that's being delivered. So a lot of times um, software is just an idea. Um, it's a series of maybe it's a logical, it's a, it's a very logically structured sequence of ideas, but at some point software falls back to this idea that it's, it's, just, an, it's just a set of ideas and to establish ownership of it, um, it's historically proved very different, difficult. Um, that's changed a lot in the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years um, where there's these mechanisms in terms of, you know, like ownership of ideas, creating a proprietary right to your ideas. Um, and, you know, to, to kind of segue into that, we talk about the competitive advantage that a company might have. Um, this affects, let's just say, like whether you're the first to market, whether you're a thought leader in the field, um, it also affects this idea of valuation because, you know, as an intangible asset, it's almost like a currency, your intellectual property. Um, so I think I'll just touch on this, I'll turn it over, you know, to Melissa or anyone else, but 
Um, so intellectual property affects the value of a company at various stages of the company. Um, at a very early stage, um, let's just say it's like a startup, a company will want to say that it has something new and it's something that, it, that idea is something that other companies can't do, knock off or copy. So upfront, if they're trying to seek a funding round, um, uh, funders and, you know, let's just say venture, venture firms and those kinds of things will want to see like, look, what's your proprietary stake in this? And intellectual property makes that kind of showing. And now later on, when you're like a public company, um, a lot of times you report your patents to the, the uh, SEC or other regulatory, you know, authorities. So in that way, th th that's like the kind of other idea of valuation, you know, the kind of late stage where a company is very large and they're saying, hey, you know what, to Wall Street, this is our measure of innovation. It's, it's This is our intellectual property portfolio. Um, let me just jump in with one more thing. Additionally, I think, you know, assertion, I think, I think the other thing that gets measured with respect to these companies is, um, you know, the, the extent they're able to assert their patents or their copyrights or whatever, their intellectual property portfolios against their competitors. I think that's also another, uh, uh, you know, uh, valuation and competitive advantage. So, McCoon, thank you for that. So, uh, just a quick so I, I know as from a software development perspective, um, can you talk a little bit about the discovery process itself? Um, and you know, what do software engineers need to look for when they're designing a product and how does it impact the intellectual property process? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I, I think, I think um, I, yeah, I remember we brainstormed a bit about this two days ago, right? And I, th I think one thing that's really helpful for software developers, for you know entrepreneurs, anybody that's you know uh, looking or innovating, is just to have an idea of the nuts and bolts of it early, and then you know kind of come up with an intellectual property pretty uh, a strategy pretty early, um, if possible. So what that would usually involve is kind of looking at the types of things that you think might be new that nobody else has done. Um, things that have business value. So this is like you know let's just say it's not just your competitive advantage. But it's also like what your customers would look for when they're when they're trying to pull you, you know, when they're trying to think about your product or service, um, and then just figure out your strategy as to say, you know, what like this is why I think I own this. This is why I think it's new, and then this is why this how this is the mechanism that I think I can use to go and protect it. Um, so that's that's kind of I think that's what I you know at least as far as the discovery, I think that's how I would go approach that discussion or that that kind of brainstorm. Sure. And, and, and Melissa, I know you've had a lot of, you know, experience in this area. Um, you work very closely with the software development groups. You want to talk a little bit about what you've seen? Yeah. So uh, repeat everything uh, what McCoon just said, but mm -hmm. also there's ways to think about discovery and brainstorming of intellectual property ideas in terms of problem and solution. So the team has identified a problem with some things with data analysis, with uh, the, the discovery of something, with the solution of something, you can make something better. Um, and the team or a particular inventor has come up with a solution to that problem, that known problem. So um, it, the problem might look different based on either the size of the company or the industry that you're in. Uh, for extra, for some of the larger companies, um, there might be metrics, uh, like McCoon was saying, um, for your patent portfolio, for value of the company. Um, but for, for smaller companies, companies might be uh, created just to solve the problem that they find. So you come up with some innovation, some software, some app, some um, medical device, something and uh, the patent or other intellectual property is gonna protect that uh, solution that you've come up with. Yeah, and, um, and, and I guess, you know, one question I have is um, as part of this brainstorming such discovery process, um, you know, for, for the both of you guys, um, you know, what, what, what are some tips that you can provide to software engineers that you guys have seen that need a little bit more assistance? Is it, you know, um, is it, you know, I, I think, you know, this is kind of a, a large topic to, from, from a software development standpoint, I mean, but, you yeah. know, is, is there a novel idea and how does it get protected? I could, I could jump in. I, I mean, sure. I could jump in with that. I think from some of us coming from big 
big company backgrounds, you know, like, like we worked at, you know, Unisys 20 years ago, right? So I think we're used to at least, you know, like of our, our uh, level or, you know, like wh whenever we went to school, we tend to think of like patents as these really like technical things. So we tend to, you know, you, you piecemeal out your technology really early. And remember like back back at, you know, like back when we were writing like Windows middleware, we'd be like, oh, this is like the rules engine module. And this was the, whatever that other thing was, that notification module or whatever, those, those things that we wrote, right? So right. we'd be like, okay, the notification module does this, this. And so sometimes when you're, with, but that that's, that's good from like a, you know, large company perspective, they need that wall of patents. Um, but I think one thing is a change in perspective a little bit from um, that view, if you're doing it on your own, I think I would pull back away from the, um, from the t real hardcore tech aspects, especially if you're early stage and kind of pull back towards your business okay. and be like, okay, well, look, you know what? Like, yeah, you know what I have? I have these notification mechanisms. That's great. Okay. But what's new about my workflow? What's new about my, uh, like even, even my business model, because this is the kind of thing that, you know, if you read in the news and stuff, people will be like, oh, you know what, this stuff's not protectable or, you know, you'll, you'll get conflicting views on this. But if you're really early stage, what I think you'd want to do is say, hey, you know what, what's new about my digital workflow that, that my consumer goes through? What's new about my consumer journey? What's new about my, um, like, like I just said, my, uh, my business model, right? How does this transform to something that's like a digital ecosystem? kind of pull back and, and just go broader and broader and broader. One tip I would have, like if you're kind of engaging in the process pretty early. Got it. No, I appreciate see. that. Yeah. I, I know. Yeah. I know sometimes we, we, you know, we tend to go down these rabbit holes of creating design and implement these designs because we're really excited about the new product. But then, um, you know, as soon as it becomes yeah. a patentable idea, we have to kind of scale back and, um, you know, work on how to, you know, m modify our existing idea to be more patentable. And that does cause some problems down, you know, downstream um, with, with the USPTO office or, or with the patent process. So I appreciate it's also, that. It also might be helpful to think about what your competitors do. Okay. So if you know that Microsoft has an API to whatever, and you're doing the same thing at a high level, that's probably not something that you want to get patent protection on because the patent office is just going to say, you know, this has been around and, and known for so long. Um, one of the questions on the chat is workflow patentable. Yes, if it's novel and non-obvious. Uh, so if anything along the way, if you're able to point to some of the big players or even the small players and say, you know, this is something that nobody else is doing either at a high level or a low level, um, that, that might be something that you want to patent. Great, thank you, Melissa. Let me go to the next slide. Let me just jump in with an example real quick. Um, and this was, let me see if I can find it. Amazon one-click ordering patent. If you guys check this out, right? Like if you just search this or something, this is like a total example of this kind of thing. Um, you know, Amazon had this thing about this one-click button. I mean, it's like a total nuisance in e-commerce. It, it's a lot of value to Amazon, right? So this is the kind of thing that I think a long time ago people like, hey, what? Like, this is this isn't really, you know, like back when they filed it, they would be like, I'm just looking at it right now. Amazon secured the patent in 1999, right? And it, it gives just some article says it represented a breakthrough for the idea of hassle-free online shopping. This is totally back in '99. Everybody looked at that and like, like one-click ordering. Like this is, you know, I mean, what's new about this? What's you know, it's it's just a narrow piecemeal, but it's like a game changer in the industry, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and I think, you know, now we, now we don't know of anything that's different than one click ordering, right? Now our kids can order it, which is even scarier. So yeah, yeah it, it's definitely an <laughs> idea that kind of um, we're seeing to ourselves today. So it makes sense. Um, I, and I, and I think, you know, around that, um, you know, some of these ideas that we do come up with, you know, I think that's kind of where the, the problem lies is number one is, is, it, is the idea, um, does it provide a competitive advantage to the corporation? And number two is, you know, what does it take for that idea to come to fruition from a patent standpoint? Um, is, you know, what I've seen is there's always some modification on the, um, a, a previous patent or on a new idea that is just slightly different 
but it makes the processes either more efficient or more state of the art. Um, you guys want to talk a little about what you guys have seen in terms of, um, you know, some of the modifications to existing ideas or maybe give some insight to what we should look for um, in terms of um, understanding what is new and relevant and, and do we need to do as a software development standpoint, do we need to do a USPTO search for these ideas before we come with, with um, the design or, <clears throat> or is it, you know, come with our design first and understand if our idea is competitive enough and then kind of attack the, the PTO approach? Uh, so the approach is going to differ per company. So um, some companies want you to do, um, some companies don't want you to do anything. So um, one of the requirements with the patent office is that you disclose everything that you know that would be relevant to the patentability of your application. So some people, I mean, it's it's more like a like an ostrich head in the sand kind of approach. Just just know what you know right now, just based on basic reading and know that yours is different and then we're just gonna move forward. Whereas other, other companies um, might have a, a approach where they want a prior art search run. So the inventor or engineering team would uh, fully describe the process or speak with a patent attorney, their in-house or outside counsel and describe the invention. And then the, the patent attorney or in-house counsel uh, would perform the prior art search. Uh, there's a lot of nuances with a prior art search. So a lot of the time that's not gonna rely on the uh, skills of the, the, the inventor because that's not something that most people <laughs> require uh, engineers to, to have full knowledge of. Uh, it's it's pretty pretty tough. So um, especially with algorithms and, and processes and stuff that that the team would be inventing. Um, so yeah, the the answer would be it depends. Um, okay. Most of the time, it's a it's a business decision. Okay. Let, let me let me jump in with one more thing, um, which is that under as far as I know the rules, there's no ethical obligation to conduct a prior art search before you file. The flip side of it is if you find prior art that you know that you can argue basically later on in litigation or something um, that someone can say is material to patentability, then you have to provide it to the office. So if you go and search and you find stuff that's really close, you generally got to provide stuff that's pretty close to the patent office. The flip side is there's no real obligation to search. That, that's you know the ethical rules. So then again, like, I mean, going back to, you know, what Melissa said, sometimes it's a case by case basis. You think about it. Um, usually like the kind of the rule that I would just throw out there um, kind of fast and loose is if you're really familiar with your technology, you probably know what's out there. You probably have a pretty good idea. If you're, if you're like, let's just say it's a new venture. Um, there's a guy that I used to represent years ago, back when I was at the law firm. Um, and this guy had a little toilet cleaner device and it was just a, really low level. He was in a, let's see, I think he's an OBGYN by profession, um, but it was like an extended release toilet cleaning thing. And he just didn't want to do this prior art search. Um, he didn't know the area and he filed this thing, this, this patent application. We wrote it and, you know, we wrote different embodiments. He tried to get uh, funding for it. Um, but really during, once we were trying to negotiate with the patent office, a, another prior art reference came back that was pretty close to on point. Um, it was pretty close to what he did. So he liked it, he was okay, he got his funding around and you know he, he was okay with his company. But if that's like a big venture and you're not familiar with your technology, I'd lean more in favor of kind of doing a search and understanding your area. Okay, okay, great. Appreciate that, both of you guys. Um, and then, and then and Makun and Melissa, you guys wanna talk a little about, you know, what is the first to file, what does that mean and how does it impact the process? Uh, yeah, I could start and um, so when the, when the team first comes up, um, or the inventor, singular or plural, comes up with uh, the solution to a problem, <clears throat> uh, it's generally a good idea to file a provisional patent application initially, because the rules with the patent office is it's the first person to race to the patent office, the first person to get the earliest date for disclosing the idea. Um, so if another person comes up a week later and has the exact same disclosure, the exact same solution to the problem, 
then um, the first person to reach the patent office with that disclosure uh, would win. So um, later in litigation, um, you'd look at the two dates and the person with the earlier date would, would have that, that um, patent or patent application. How complete so, does that initial provisional patent have to be or the, the provisional? It has, to, it has to enable somebody of um, knowledge in the art to make or use the invention. So you need to have all of the steps of the invention fully disclosed in the patent application. Uh, saying that though, there's times that I filed um, presentation slides, um, a technical paper, uh, the technical paper gets published the same day that we want to file the provisional patent application so that you have that date. Um, there's some exceptions, um, like if the inventor is the same person that wrote the, the article the, of the publication, then you have like a year or so um, to file the application if it's the same inventorship. Um, but to be but to be right. safe, you you likely want to the provisional patent applications are pretty cheap relative to a full non-provisional patent application. Great. Great. Okay. Can, can I just add to that? One thing also is for if you, if you do that and you don't file the provisional, your foreign filing rights are generally gone, right? So that's that's kind of one you know if you want to file international you could file in the u.s still for one year right that's one little like tidbit or something about that um and then the other thing about that is as far as how enabled it has to be the, the rule is very strict the, the the way it's written but then ultimately it depends on how much you want to leave later to litigation to say how, whether this was a question of fact um was this thing actually enabled meaning did it allow someone that reads it the ability to go and practice your ownership interest, which is what's in the claims, right? So that's, it's, it's, it's kind of this weird, it's a, it just depends on how uncertain you want it to be against what your budget is and your timeline. So, so it sounds like as long as, you know, the, the, the idea is there, it's documented, um, and we actually initially fill out the provisional application itself, that should be enough to get that. A little program. bit, no, no, no. So, Okay, so let me just say one more thing. That's usually sure. like, I think, I think there's like three issues that patent lawyers usually get like hit for malpractice over and over and over again. So okay. this is like, and this is one of the three issues. One of them is like blowing a foreign filing deadline, right? That's like, they, they get hit like patent, every patent lawyer over their career just gets hit like just over and over with like, that's like pitfall number one. I forget whatever pitfall number, pitfall number three basically is filing a provisional application that's not fully enabled and then you just get screwed because then later on they go like oh, it's not enabled it, it, and then, see what happens is is you file this kind of limited provisional and then you spend your year and you, you develop it out and you have this kind of beautiful application and then something happens in the interim there's like a release or a competitor gets in there or something that's in that middle part right. then 10 years later when your idea is ripe and it's monetizing all of a sudden it's worth millions of dollars and they sue somebody and they go back to that provisional and they're like oh guess what um you know that you filed just you know like like a single page provisional which is a bunch of bullet points um and then a lot of times they go after the patent attorney too for malpractice for that um so yeah then anyway that's that's just one of these things that it's supposed to be thorough and full filled out um but it's fudged a lot because this budget and timeline thing there's also arguments that you can make to the patent office that somebody of knowledge in the art would have known how to implement an algorithm that you just bulleted uh, in the provisional application. Sure. So there's a there's a backup arguments that you can make, but um, those are are pretty risky because you're basically telling the patent office that everyone already knows how to do this. So it's you're given that um, get out of jail free card, but you want to use it very sparingly because you want to still uh, express to the patent office that what you did is novel and non-obvious and people wouldn't have thought about this uh, without your invention. Great, great, okay. Great. Um, and then also maybe the next topic, I know, um, you know, we talked a little bit about considerations and, um, you know, what's patentable, what's not, but you guys want to talk a little bit about you know, what to look for, the budget, the number of applications um, in enforcement. Yeah, do, you want me, do you want me to jump in on this one or do you want to take more? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I could, yeah I, that'd be great. I, I could just start with it. Um, yeah, so usually this is kind of what we were talking about. I think we kind of brainstormed this through a few days ago. Um, usually I think 
you know, as far as, far as if you're a software engineer or an entrepreneur or something, um, what you want to do is, at least for me, this is my recommendation, try to go and figure out your IP strategy up front rather than being super reactive to it. Um, and there's a bunch of things you can look for. Um, I would talk to people, talk to patent attorneys or talk to other people that, you know, like in, in, your, in your network, um, but talk about like your filing strategy. And so this is things like your budget. Well, what do you want to kind of, you know, what's an appropriate budget for your projected sales and for the competitors that you would have um, and kind of your, you know, your geographical scope. Um, and then also the number or types of applications you want to file. Um, I would, I would at least brainstorm through, I got this enforcement scenarios. This is kind of like, look, like if I want a patent in, I don't know, like Korea, do you think I could really bring a lawsuit in Korea? Do I have competitors in Korea? Um, or are my competitors in Korea really likely going to sell to the United States? How does this go against my budget? So that's just kind of like your foreign filing scenario. Um, and then of course, you know, your, your markets, um, that's, you know, where you'll sell, where your customers are, or where your competitors are. Um, and, uh, you know, again, that goes back, your markets go back again to your enforcement scenarios. Like, you know, for example, there's a company that I worked with a few years ago and they were, they were thinking about, you know, they're a defense company. So they were going into like, I don't know, like Israel. And then we were talking about Saudi Arabia and they're like, well, I can bring a lawsuit in Israel. I don't think I could bring a lawsuit in Saudi Arabia. I don't, I don't know what the, you know, judicial process looks like, you know, over there or another country was India. They were like, I, well, Indian patent enforcement's up in the air. Um, especially with respect to pharmaceuticals. So it's just one of these things that, you know, maybe maybe it's not worth the budget now. Um, and then the last thing is like, well, I think this is the important one is uh, trade secrets. Um, I think early on in your strategy, I think you should figure out like, okay, so this is one thing we didn't touch on earlier, but everything that's in a patent application, all those words goes out to the public about 18 months after your first filing date. So if you have a provisional application with bullet points, you file your utility case in a year, about six months after that utility case, all those bullet points in the provisional, as well as everything you wrote in your utility case, those are all out in the public, they're published. So you got to figure out, well, I think early on say, is this kind of idea what I want to publish and what I want my competitors to basically know about? Um, or is this something that I want to keep internally as a trade secret? So I think, I think those are the kinds of considerations I would think through. Great, great. No, that really helps. And I, I know, go, anything you can add. Yeah, no, I know for at least, at least from my, my perspective, I, I know, um, you know, there was a scenario where um, at our current firm, there was an idea of um, creating a patent, but then we were a little hesitant of doing that because we didn't want to give away our secret sauce or our trade secrets. And so um, it's it's a constant conversation that we have with our, our, our teams here, at least at the company I work for. And so it, it is definitely an interesting um, area where we don't want to give away too much, but we still want to patent our original idea. Yeah, it's really a balancing act because you're given the right to exclude other people from doing what you've given to the public. So the patent office is very careful about giving you that exclusivity right to um, perform these actions. Some of the trade-offs that may happen with uh, determining maybe particular algorithms or trade secrets is um, the workflows. Um, Oliver on the chat um, is mentioning the workflow and how it changes over time. That the workflow might be something that you file the patent application on. And then when it comes to the trade secret that you keep secret, it might be the particular algorithm ah. of you know, something, something in the workflow. So you yeah. still need to be able to enable um, somebody of skill in the art to perform the workflow, but maybe the actual algorithm of data processing or something is going to be kept the trade secret. So there's ways and, that you could balance. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, let me add one more thing. Sometimes one thing to watch for um, is specific algorithms. Um, so usually you don't want to just you know, like, let's just say you have a specific, specific parent, at least right now, my current present company, you know, uh, as with many other medical device companies, sometimes some of the software has very specific parameters and, and measurements that correspond to like very direct anatomical portions. Like, I don't know, let's say you measure an ear or something, ear cavity. And, you know, there, there are certain ways that kind of engineers have done that through simulation software. So that stuff, usually you don't want to reveal outside. Uh, business really hardcore, like, 
the nuts and bolts of your business, you don't you don't want to go and get that out. Financials, you don't want to get out, right? So that stuff, you want to scrub your applications and make sure your patent attorney scrubs that stuff out of there. Um, as far as the workflow evolving, um, the workflow does change, right? It doesn't invalidate it if you change your workflow. You still get exclusivity. Um, so that's something I don't, I don't think we, it's kind of a nuts and bolts type of thing. But what a patent, a patent doesn't give you the right to practice your invention. It gives you the right to exclude others from the invention. So this is like the example of, uh, of let's just say you have a patent to a road bike. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's just say someone else has the patent to a road bike. And then you get the patent to like the suspension on a mountain bike. You still can't make a mountain bike because someone else has the patent to the regular old bike with the chain and the, you know, wheels and pedals and stuff like that. All you get is to exclude people from making a bike with shocks, right? So this goes back to this more digital workflow thing. You patent your workflow, that just means other people can't use the workflow as described in the claims of your patent. They can take anything else from the specification that you can claim even. That's like this idea of stuff out in the public. They can take that, they can go and run with that. Um, and then there's a, 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 you know, if we keep going, we can we can talk about continuation practice and ways to insulate your patent against challenge. And there, there's like, you know, I mean, this is like an entire, it's like a chess game and you could spend, you know, 20, 30 years just figuring out all the little angles there. But, but basically, you know, so to answer this, if you change your workflow, it does not invalidate your patent if you have a patent on it. Um, it makes sense. So here's the thing. And then the next part of this, it, it, to, to me, just to answer it just off the cuff, I think it makes sense to apply early, but after like an idea of what you are going to commercialize. So if you, if you have an, if, let's just say it's way, way out there, you know, probably not. If you have a few kind of realistic scenarios, I think it's a good idea to reach out. Um, and then let me just say one more thing about digital workflow uh, applications. Um, it's usually good to have someone to talk to someone that knows software patents, right? So that's, that's like, so each, each, uh, I don't know, let's just say each uh, patent attorney has their own technical background. Some people do polymers, some people do like biotechnology, some people just, you know, I don't know, they do like hardcore stuff for Halliburton, right? Like, you know, just like real mechanical stuff. And then some people do just like, uh, like, you know, some people focus on software UI and stuff. So sometimes it's good if you have this kind of idea, just to even engage them early, talk through these ideas and just be like, hey, you know what, like, um, you know, um, you know, I hear your firm has a good software practice, you know, um, what do you think, how do you think I could take these steps? And usually, I mean, let me just say one more thing. Sometimes, you know, in terms of selecting attorneys, it's good to just have someone that you can, that, that understands your language. Um, like, so someone at a law firm usually that kind of gets it and gets the tech, gets your business and kind of gets your objectives. You know what I mean? So I, I think, I think that's, those are some of the ideas I would think about like protecting digital workflows. You talk to somebody that's really old school, they'll be like, yeah, you can't protect it, you know, and then and then you just show this Amazon one click thing that just wreaks havoc on the whole market, where you look at any, you know, Facebook patents or kind of, I mean, I don't, does anybody here work for Snapchat? I hope not, but, you know, like at least Snapchat's early patent strategy, right? You know, I mean, no, no, I don't mean to, you know, but like, you know, like the early patent strategy was they didn't have that many, Twitter didn't have that many, right? And so that was a kind of a competitive disadvantage early on, I think. Yeah, Google was really against them too. Okay. Uh, and in our, in our, oh, go ahead, Melissa. Sorry. Yeah, one other thing uh, on the considerations list that you um, read out a, a little bit ago, the markets. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that you want to consider is the different parts of the end product. Mm -hmm. um, if the product is programmed in the U.S. and manufactured in China or India or um, intends to be sold at another location, you likely want to have uh, patent protection in each of those jurisdictions. So consider where the overall um, life cycle of the product is going to exist if it's not just going to be in the U.S. Uh, that's something that you want to discuss uh, with patent counsel as well. Great, great. And I think one other topic that I wanted to bring up was the defensive strategy. I know you guys kind of alluded to it, but um, yeah. some of the larger corporations will provide can you talk a little bit about what does that defensive strategy looks like from a patent standpoint? Yeah, sure. I want to jump in, Melissa. Okay. Okay. So yeah, defensive strategy. So so patents, you know, they're like offensive. We keep talking about it because you know I'm assuming the audience is a little, uh, you know, we're starting a company or we're higher up in strategy. 
a lot of large companies maintain like walls of defenders to power. Uh, defensive patents and some of the noted players here were like IBM back in the day. Um, I think so. This is just a story I heard at one of these talks, maybe like ten years ago or something. I think um, was it Microsoft? I, th I, th I think Microsoft was trying to get its start and probably Windows ninety five or something, and then uh, they tried to sue IBM for something. And IBM had like these boxes of software patents that they just dragged out, and it was just like I think I think Bill Gates at that time. But this is just you know old wives story, so I don't I have no idea if it's true or not. But he was like, we need to get better at this. This is like something that they were at a you know significant competitive disadvantage for back then, because um, you know it's just it's just like the old school way of thinking about it. it's like you can patent this. That's weird, right? Like you can patent this idea of you know software, right? Like so anyway, so so a lot of large companies what they do is they'll have a defensive they'll they'll have patents for defensive purposes, which are these short quite often, you know, short, uh, not very thoroughly developed patents that they don't really intend to go and um, assert against anyone. They just do it so that no one else can patent the idea. And they're, so this is like, you know, I mean, you know, a bunch of large companies do this. Um, many large companies have very low budgets for these, um, for these kinds of applications, but they push a lot, but they push them out a lot. And so if we've worked in a large company, a lot of times that's either what we've contributed to or that we've seen, um, Another way to, another way, Makun is exactly right. Uh, another way to do that is put, uh, going back to the example of a workflow. So you have the workflow that you're gonna implement in your app, and then you brainstorm other ways to do the workflow. So um, with the original patent application, you might disclose three or four different workflows that would be applicable in the particular situation. So that later on you could file uh, what's called continuation applications. And each of those continuation applications would be directed to another workflow that's disclosed in that initial application. I see. Interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. You know, to me, it's it's really interesting that you know um, there's this defensive and offensive strategies around patents, and you know we all want to protect ourselves, but at the same time, we want to be innovative at the same time. But then there's also obviously there's a you know there's a there's a um, business and revenue impact to all these different strategies and implications of filing patents. Um, and kind of going on to that same type of topic, um, I know there's, you know, in the development world, you know, we've been um, accustomed to more open source technologies. And so now we're working with the open source technology, but then we also want to patent our idea that's related to open source technology. So can you talk a little bit about what that FOSS option looks like and how that impacts a prior art search? Yeah, with uh, open source, um, there's different types, as everyone knows, there's different types of open source. You could um, borrow a, a function, you could borrow a data set, you could borrow uh, or use any type of um, information that is available via open source. So with each of the uses of open source, there's limitations on how you could use that. Um, I recently, I, I've been doing a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence patents, and a lot of those models are trained on open source data sets. So you need to look at the, um, the licensing limitations associated with the data sets that you're using. Some of them are, are wide open. You could use this for any reason. Um, there's a couple um, education, uh, academic data sets that are um, pretty limiting. Uh, they don't want you to use it for commercial purposes. So are you using the open source data set for um, training your model or are you actually gonna send your data set or part of a data to a customer in a commercial transaction? Um, so there's different considerations um, whenever there's open source involved, whether it's a function, the data or something else, um, that's a red flag that you uh, need to look into that further. Got it, thank you, yeah, and no, that helps. Um, yeah, I know I, I, I actually um, run into this quite a bit where, you know, we're, we're trying to be um, more efficient with our time when we're developing a new product. And so we want to kind of take advantage of some open source software that's already created for us. But then, you know, you know from, a, from a management standpoint, we're always thinking about is this idea patentable and then, you know, what are the implications of using open source um, downstream? So I appreciate that. That helps a lot. Um, you know, going along that same topic, um, is, 
Yeah, go ahead, Makun. Oh, I said, and then and then remember the only the, the thing with open source and understanding is that it it's really about releasing the source code, right? Right. Not not so so I mean the 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 question is whether you can still patent it. Um, if you're really like thinking about it, if you're picking which package to use, open source package to use, I think it can influence that. If you're kind of going through this idea of like, you know, should I patent this? Oh no, I used an open source package or something. I would, I would consider don't, don't pull yourself back at that point because there's alternatives to your code base, right? So you could be like, look, I still have this new functionality. Maybe it's a new machine learning system or whatever, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing. You could still go through this entire patent process um, and then if it's commercially viable, I think you can switch your libraries out. You can basically recode it, right? Right. That's right. So that's, that's anyway, that's, that's the two cents on the practice. Yeah, practice that's a great point. Idea. It's, it's the imaginary lines between trade secret patent process, and then what happens after, once you have a product. So do you want to sell the product? Do you want to license the product? Do you want to license the, um, patent that you get eventually? Um, there's all sorts of considerations, um, because the patent, the issued patent is now your property. So you have the product or the software that is your property, but then you also have the, the patent that's your property. And each of those can have different um, monetization pathways. Sure. Got it. Got it. it helps. Yeah, that helps a lot. Um, you know, one other question is, you know, when is the right time to involve a patent attorney? I mean, is it when we, when, when, this, when the strategy is complete? Um, is it earlier on in the process? What does that look like? Oh, you know what? It's, 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 it's a little bit of just depending on where you are with your product development cycle, right? And, and where you are with your idea, what your budget is. Um, usually, I think it's better to involve someone earlier, just, just based on my own, you know, just having done it for 20 years. I think it's better to involve someone earlier and get, it, get their input into the strategy because you tend to get something broader that way. Um, if you get, if you, if you involve someone a little later, they can still do it. I'm not saying, you know, it's not, it's not a big deal. Um, the, but, but I think, I think what you could, what, what, what can happen is you can piecemeal your inventions into smaller chunks and you get like this, like, I don't know, let's just say like, uh, a bunch of different fragments rather than like a unified kind of theory that protects your core of your company. So I, I think do it earlier, but again, it's your budget. And then the next thing is, it depends on whether you want to go and talk to your, so first it depends on whether you want to pay for somebody right then. Next thing is um, if you want to involve someone in the nuts and bolts of your company that early, because that's also like a little bit scary, right? If, you, if you're really early and it's your new idea and then you're all of a sudden talking to basically a vendor, right? A patent attorney that's trying to sell you something, mm -hmm. that, that's a little bit daunting. And then it's also like, you kind of, I don't know, it, it might throw your focus off a little bit. So I think I think there's a little bit of a you know it's 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 uh it's a little bit of an art to it um, but but I think I would recommend earlier is better if you can trust somebody and you have the budget. Great, great, that helps. Thank you, hey, hey guys. I'm uh, sorry, real quick, just not sorry to interrupt. Uh, I know we've got sorry. ten minutes left, and I, I did want there were a couple questions on the Q and A. Right. I wanted to make sure we got to. Um, but so I just wanted to uh, jump in real quick. I, sorry, Melissa, I didn't mean to. to step no, on you're you good. You're good. Um, so I know we had, so Nanette asked a couple questions. Um, she asked, let's see, so are art designs or virtual reality world art patentable in VR software? Yeah, there's, um, there's three different types of patents. There's utility, which is a manufacturer machine a method, which is generally what software falls into, or composition of matter, which is like chemistry and, and plant and uh, stuff like that. There's design patents, and then there's uh, plant patents. So uh, VR, um, if you have a unique, uh, novel, non-obvious way of um, not the functionality of the VR, but the ornamental design of um, the virtual reality space um that could be something that is covered under a design patent and let me let me just jump in so so it, it's it's part patents and then it's also remember there's also uh trademarks for anything that you're trying to brand um and then also uh copyrights for any of your expressive mm. content um addition there's something called trade dress which is like the look and feel and the colors and things like that mm. so as far as art design specifically Maybe, maybe you're right. I mean, most steps we write, there's design patents for that. The other thing, of course, is just copyright, 
right? The the idea that they're ripping off other people would be ripping off your specific designs. Um, but, but yeah, that that kind of follows into Nanette's other question. So um, she writes, uh, she's heard she's heard of a case where this guy created and filed a patent for a product and tried to sell it to a large enterprise. And they ended up taking his idea and logo and gave him nothing. How can a lone inventor with a patent protect um, oneself against the large corporation with a team? Oh, he, he tried to sell it to them and then they, they took it, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll tell you another parallel story. Is, is there's this, you know, my daughter and one of her uncles basically wrote the script as Zootopia. Yeah. And I hope nobody seems here, but okay. So they, so he went and took the, he wrote the script of Zootopia. He took it to Disney. Um, and according to him, Disney basically like, I think they might've reused the name even and all the characters, the narrative, everything. They rewrote it through like a script doctor. Um, and then it's Zootopia, right? It's this gigantic movie. And he's in this, I think he might be in like year five of the lawsuit. Oh my goodness. So, I mean, this guy, this guy just got screwed. I mean, this isn't patents, but this is, you know, um, screenplay and entertainment. And stuff. Right, um, copyright, so what's yeah. this idea? How can a lone inventor? Oh, okay. Lone inventor with a single patent. Okay. So first thing I want to say is don't file a single patent. Um, multiple. Um, as Melissa just pointed out, you know, there's continuation practice. So it's a one. Okay. So one way to do it is file early. Okay. Engage someone early in strategy to broaden your patent coverage. Second thing is don't. Or I guess third thing, um, don't just file a single patent. File multiple. And that might be a common specification with different utility cases that claim priority to it. And that's the thing you would talk about, that kind of continuation strategy. Um, and then another thing is, oh God, so it's, it's going to be hard to go to a company and have them sign your NDA. I'll tell you that because I think most companies usually have you sign their NDA. But if you're approaching a company, um, usually it's hard, you know, it's hard to draft an NDA and then just go out to uh, where is it like Mattel or one of these big companies and just say, Hey, you know what, like you know, sign my NDA. Um, but so those are some of the ways you could do it. Don't, uh, you know, go early, try to protect broadly. Uh, don't just have a single, um, uh, single patent, try to get a patent portfolio. Um, and then, you know, try to approach them strategically, um, and see if they can get like some kind of NDA type coverage. Yeah. My, uh, one, agreement. yeah. one of my questions would be, um, whether the inventor with the the loan patent has a, an attorney with them because you if you go into a negotiation or some other deal and one side doesn't have an attorney and the other one does uh, let alone a team of attorneys that's not going to be a, a really fair fight because there's there's lots of rules that they would know that they could use to their favor um so try to make it a fair fight. Um, also, money is is heavily dependent on that process. So if you have a patent and it's a really good patent and there's no issues with the patent, you still need somebody to argue that. Um, I mean that that one of them deserves the the protection over the other one. Um, I this is Pooja. I have a question. Um, I think it might kind of have gotten lost in the chat, and it's a it's a little bit um, similar to what you guys are already talking about. Um, what are protections for? I guess the little guys, and you know, right now maybe we're only talking about even U.S. corporations like Disney. And if they won't follow the rules, um, what chance do you have against maybe a Chinese company or Indian company or an well, Indian yeah. landscape? Like, so Pooja, how, one thing, how does the little guy kind of defend themselves against? corporations or you know corporations that have so, um cahoots with the government i guess or you know the, oh not the power yeah I, I, I mean i i i wouldn't i wouldn't look at it too crazy as like cahoots with the government I, I, it's more just like you know um you know first thing is don't don't uh don't uh assert patents individually right don't don't just have like one single filing you know have multiple um some other things, I, I, we didn't even mention this, but there's, you know, the, the, the process of enforcing a patent is pretty intense because there's a patent trial and appeal board, which, you know, in, in, historically has invalidated many, many patents, you know, um, after they're granted. So even once you've enforced it as an inventor, it's hard to go and, you know, kind of just really bring a big company down. Um, but so, so some of the ways, like, I, like, you know, I think we're kind of addressed it is one, uh, consider, you know, uh, filing application families rather than just single ones. Um, consider international coverage pretty early um, or your foreign filing strategy. 
Um, and then just figure out what it is that you want to disclose exactly. Like, can you just piecemeal the idea to them without giving up like the big secrets, right? So that those are those are some ways you could do that, I think. And, and go ahead. So. Yeah, another option would be to try to sell the patent or license the patent to another individual that's already using it. Um, that would be a, a thorough negotiation process and patent litigation is millions and millions of dollars. Uh, I've been on cases where the, um, the opposing attorney would call the plaintiff and, and say, you know, if, if your offer isn't in the seven below seven figures that I'm not even going to consider it. So th there's, there's legal departments where they're, they're saying, you know, if, um, I'm willing to, to just pay to, to get you to go away and, you know, that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there's ways to still monetize it without bringing it to litigation. Um, if you don't want them to do it at all, then um, I've seen companies that uh, spin off part of um, a technical division so that that technical division could be its own standalone company. And um, when that happens, uh, they do a like a call for patents. They wanna make sure that they have all the patents and they're willing to pay money for those patents that are out there um, to bolster that, that side company. Yeah, when we were at, we're next to, actually, McCoon, when we, when we left Unisys, there's a, a group at our company that the entire team left the company to start their own company because of that oh. same type of argument. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it, it definitely happens. Like, I've seen it about two or three times in my career. Yeah, there's, it happens all the time. There's lots of ways to do all this. It's, it's like a big game of chess, like somebody said earlier. Right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's stuff that you don't think about. And then once you're kind of, you know... Um, in that environment, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. So. Yeah, a few years ago, um, there was a pretty big company and they didn't have any patents and they had um, a team come in and brainstorm with, they went to each of the engineering groups because it was a big enough company that they had multiple engineering groups that were uh, uh, doing different products. And um, the patent attorneys brainstormed with each of those, pro those groups and it came up with 200 patents to file immediately, I mean, within a month's time. Um, but that's probably something that you don't want to do. Um, you want to file early, especially now with the, the first to file system. Uh, make sure you have uh, coverage and uh, protection of your, your, your ideas, whether you're, you're a big, small, uh, big or small company. Great. And Feature, can I just jump in on the budget issue? I think yeah. there's that was one question. Okay, so the budget issue is, you know, it just depends. Um, and so, I mean, I would, I would give a range of between seven and maybe even like $20,000 for the initial first filings, depending on how complex you want or whatever. I mean, this just depends. Every firm does it differently. But so the, I guess the important part is the, your cost isn't done at your first kind of engagement with the attorney. You also have to go and if you want to continue with the problem with the patent, you got to go and um, you know negotiate with the office, and then your foreign filing strategy is going to cost you money. So I think when you talk to somebody like that, just say, hey, you know, what's my what's my upfront cost? What's it going to cost me a year? Or what's going to cost me in two, three, five? Right? Just kind of kind of break that down. Um, and I think I think you know the across the industry, I think it's pretty um, you know th there's a little bit of variation, but it's not going to be too crazy. Great, great. And I think that this really helps all of us just kind of understand what it takes to, um, you know, have a, an idea, patent it, and how it applies to software or a corporation. So um, does anyone have any other questions? I know we're running right against one o'clock. So, well, if no one has any yeah, additional- I think, I, we, uh, this is Pooja. Uh, thank you so much. It was a very, very informative topic and I'm sure we can have some more follow-up. Um, I think, yeah, BJ, just the thank you slides. Yeah, great. Yeah, so thank you, um, Melissa McCoon, for you know, volunteering and um, joining our Lunch and Learn series today. Um, for the group, uh, please reach out to any of the links on the screen um, to join our Facebook or LinkedIn pages or even our YouTube page as well. And um, if you guys have any questions, please reach out to the ISIS alumni board. And we look forward to hosting additional Lunch and Learns. So thank you again. Have a great day. CJ. Great. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Makun. Thanks, BJ. Thank you.